All right, well, let's jump straight into it. We are up to the year 2000. Um, Bill Clinton is now out of office. Well, we should maybe just start with 2000 and, and go through 2001. Where were you and what were you thinking when uh, Al Gore sort of conceded the election to George Bush in 2000 after the Supreme Court decision? I was on a college campus at Brown University, and I was among a group of students who were uh, organized, self-organized to chant uh, something like Gore fight back, Gore refuse, something like that, knowing that the Gore was knowing, undoubtedly, the Gore was going to cave and uh, in his own gentlemanly way, being part of the uh, American aristocracy, which went out of power, always plans to come back into power for a century, uh, had uh, decided to uh, bow out. It was a big disappointment, uh, but uh, the moment of interest earlier that fall was undoubtedly uh, the appearance of uh, Ralph Nader on campus, uh, who I supported along with a lot of students and and other people. He was not going to get anywhere. We don't believe that his votes were decisive in changing the election. It was because, because Gore, Gore ran such a poor race. But at any rate, that's 2000. Uh, I was on the lip, I suppose, of the last moment in which the Hollywood blacklistees were attending ceremonies where they were uh, told that Hollywood was sorry, they'd been so misused. Some people in Hollywood, my friends, were working to restore the film credits that had been taken away from them, or they never had because they had been uh, writing under assumed names. And it was sort of a moment of the last moment of a certain kind of, of liberalism before the descent of Bushism and 9-11 uh, and the, the wars to come. So would I call it a hopeful moment? Not at all. But it was a moment of thinking that uh, we probably had to take some other path and look further ahead. Can you tell us a little bit about that history and uh, with regard to Hollywood blacklisting, Paul, for people who might be listening and not know? Yeah, uh, it became important to me because I was born in 1944, and I had always sort of liked the movies up to the uh, early 1950s. I was too young to, to appreciate them very well, but uh, as I began to see them replayed on television and uh, as I began to think about things as a, as a teenager, I realized that there had been really great films, great in every way, but especially notable for their anti-fascist uh, features and uh, for a lot of ways in which they challenged the status quo, including the power of the rich over the poor and and so on, and, and during the war years even began to push hard against racial exclusion from from film. So it, it had always interested me, and because in the 1970s and 1980s I published this magazine about popular culture, cultural correspondence, trying to get people interested in the idea that there was something within American popular culture that gave a clue to uh, a mass thinking that was anything but reactionary, as ambivalent as it was. So when I uh, got uh, a, an urge from a, a former blacklisty, actually the wife of a, of, of a known, uh, well-known film editor, to go to Hollywood, where she had been until she and her husband were driven out, uh, I thought this is the moment. And I uh, met uh, Ring Lardner Jr. actually in New York. Uh, who'd uh, won a couple of Oscars, but 25 years in between, thanks to being blacklisted. And he gave me the name of the person known as the last Marxist of Hollywood, uh, Abraham Lincoln Polanski, who had uh, written a couple of hugely admired noir films at the end of the 1940s and a very strong women's film at the beginning of the 1950s. And then... Uh, you would say didn't work again under his own name for uh, 15 years until he made a film with Harry Belafonte, who would wanted him to produce several more films on race themes. Uh, that didn't work. But uh, he worked in Hollywood. He was one of the writers 
for uh, You Are There, the, the most highly acclaimed television show of the middle 1950s. No one knew for its first two years that it was written by people under the blacklist, uh, mainly him and uh, Walter Bernstein, uh, who later became uh, known for uh, a Woody Allen film called The Front. Uh, and uh, he'd done this and done that, mainly fixing scripts, and not under his own name, and then reemerged in the 60s and 70s a little bit, and uh, then uh, faded out, mainly for health reasons, but who knew everybody, but more important, everybody knew him as a person who was a, a deep thinker, uh, a, a very well-educated uh, person in modernism and Marxism and so forth. Most screenwriters uh, were from modest backgrounds and really didn't have such a cultural uh, connection as, as he did with U.S. history and so on. So uh, I and uh, Dave Wagner, who led a newspaper strike here in Madison in the late 1970s and never got his byline back, uh, he and I uh, wrote a biography of Abraham Lincoln Polanski uh, called uh, A Very Dangerous Citizen, because when Polanski had been called to testify at the House Committee on American Activities, he had been called a, a dangerous citizen by uh, someone in the military who showed up because Polanski had uh, worked in, in intelligence uh, during uh, World War II. At any rate, we, we wrote that. Uh, we wrote it just following the appearance of a 700-page tome of interviews called Tender Comrades, which uh, really was uh, – uh, very uh, influential in bringing the full story of the, of the blacklistees to, to the minds of the public and received a, a lot of attention, a lot of hostility from the Wall Street Journal, that sort of thing. So with, with these two volumes, uh, Dave Wagner and I launched a series of three more. Uh, the first was called Radical Hollywood. It was the story of the blacklistees and the films they wrote and also their their politics. They basically were communists until the later 1940s or, or early 1950s. Uh, and then followed it with Hide in Plain Sight, which was a, a sequel about what happened to the blacklisties from 1950 on. Many found uh, a way to write in television under assumed names, including Robin Hood, Ventures of Robin Hood, my very favorite television show when I was 14. Um, and uh, others went abroad, and some of them became very famous, such as uh, Jules Dawson, who, who wrote um, A Never on Sunday, and uh, Joseph Losey, who uh, wrote any number of wonderful uh, films, uh, and uh, several others with uh, films written under pseudonyms, including, uh, oh gosh, um, Planet of the Apes whose original, the first, was sort of an attack on McCarthyism, although hardly anybody saw the joke at the time, and and a bunch of other, other films before they uh, reached the end of their, their lives. But this gave me an opportunity to look, uh, take a dance look at, oh, maybe three or four hundred films. There were more films available by that time on TCM and various other ways, uh, films that hadn't been known uh, made a comeback. And I could, uh, Dave Wagner, I could look at them very closely, analyze them, and also interview the victims of the blacklist who were still alive and talk about the situation and uh, study the scholarship that had begun to emerge on the subject, which was pretty thin and not much thicker now. Uh, and mostly focused on a very few famous directors, uh, whereas our view was to include everyone and everything, including the vast number of, let's uh, call them cowboy films, uh, which in the hands of blacklist, later to be blacklisted writers, are often about the bankers being the real villains. Uh, and other sorts of films that were in the second uh, layer, uh, the, the second feature, uh, and uh, the kind of thing that would disappear when the viewership of, of films went way down and, and television took over that, that B category. But in the time of films, most films being watched ever, most theaters uh, ever, being filled most ever, that is 1945, 1946, and then trailing off after that, 
there were hundreds, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of films made every year. And so there was ample work for people on the left from kids' films to slapstick to uh, high drama uh, during World War II, about World War II, and touching on issues of, of race and anti-Semitism, cause the kinds of subjects that had been forbidden up until now. This is a good segue into sort of a new period of like a political witch hunt, and that is following 2001. So 2001 hits September 11, 2001. Uh, if you could sort of talk about where you were at that time, Paul, and, and what you were thinking in the, in the lead up to the war after that and the Bush administration's response. Yeah, well, I, again, I was personally uh, uh, fortunately situated to be at a university where I, my job wasn't in any trouble, but uh, where there was a strong enough sensibility about the things that were coming, some possibility to organize uh, around the, the coming war uh, invasion of Iraq and expose the lies and, and so forth and so forth. And some really very uh, wonderful meetings You when you think of the horrors of the war to come and the stupidity of it all, it, it seems uh, crazy to think of uh, treasuring moments of, of hanging out with Tony Kushner or uh, a few movie stars that were militantly anti-war. Uh, it was great to hear them speak and, and, understand what kind of contribution they were making, and then uh, the inevitable sense of, of, uh, of defeat sunk in and the realization that we were not going to be able to organize an anti-war movement on the scale of the Viet anti-Vietnam War movement, in part because uh, there was uh, no draft, in part because of the 9-11 sensibility, the U.S. being attacked, so-called, uh, and various other reasons that uh, made our struggle intense uh, and uh, for the most part brief in terms of, of numbers of people and things we could do. And then the, a sinking sense that the Democratic Party was not destined to offer an opposition to the imperial expansion of, uh, of war and, and pressure upon the rest of the world. So that I and a few other people responded with enthusiasm to the formation of uh, new Students for a Democratic Society in 2006, 2007. It seemed like a great idea. At first, it seemed to reach small schools and religious schools that uh, the original SDS had just begun to reach when it broke up due to factionalism. And then the experiment crashed. And we don't know why it crashed. Uh, it never had a real Nash functioning national office, which could have been the reason. But uh, at any rate, and, and on the other hand, uh, uh, the young Democrats, Democratic Socialists of America actually opposed the war while still remaining loyal to the Democratic Party. So for many young people, that was much more appealing. Uh, and uh, so that uh, came to a, a, an untimely end, you might say. But it would have ended anyway because the Obama campaign roused such wild enthusiasm, even from those of us skeptical about such things uh, within the Democratic Party, because of the interracialism, because of the black community enthusiasm, and because things seemed to be turning a, a different way within the U.S. And I was asked to prepare a, an outline for a comic about Obama's life coming up to the presidency and uh, somehow it was the opportunity was missed just barely and I always wonder afterward what I would have felt about uh, if I had managed to write the script for for an artist uh, the back story was pretty good it's just that the uh, the front story of the Obama administration was so terrifyingly disappointing and I think that was the reinforced the sense in the year 2000 that we were in it for the long run and we'd better find ways to prepare materials and reach audiences over over that long run because the, we because there really weren't any options uh, available to us uh, so that uh, maybe that's my segue into the creation of comic art 
because I'd substantially given up writing scholarly books with the sense that I'd gone as far as I could along those lines and fewer and fewer people were writing scholarly books and even the print runs of scholarly books were dipping down to a thousand or below and going straight into libraries. So, so what else can you possibly do? Well, that brought me back to my childhood uh, love of some comic books anyway. Uh, and uh, it brought me up to the realization that came in the 1990s and writing about comics in the, the nation and the village voice that makes me part of this, I guess, in which comic art was being recognized as a legitimate art form. Uh, Art Spiegelman's mouse was certainly the, the highest uh, considered, but uh, by shortly after 2000, things like Fun Home by Alison Bechdel got a great write-up in the New York Times, and, and a few other comics were being recognized as as a, a form of serious art. And around 2005, there was a Masters of Comic Art a uh, traveling exhibit, which didn't travel very far, showing how the masters of comic art weren't so honored after all. But at least it, it, it offered a splash into the sensibility of an international movement of comic artists with a strong left-wing component, as there had been in the rise of the underground comics that I was part of in a sort of way in the very late 1960s and, and 1970s. So... A, a an old friend from SDS approached me around 2003 and said that the uh, centenary of the industrial workers of the world was coming in the year 2005. They had been founded in in 1905 in Chicago, and and did I want to do something with that since I'd been writing about comic art? And I said absolutely. So. Uh, along with a, a collective of people who've been publishing an annual uh, radical comic anthology since 1979 or 1980 uh, called uh, World War III Illustrated, I uh, formed a, a, part, a partnership of sort and found a publisher, my left-wing publisher, Versa Books, and connected the oldest generation of radical comics artists uh, including Spain Rodriguez, who would be dying a few years later, uh, with the youngest generation, young artists aged 20, 22, somewhere around in there, who just just barely come onto the scene. And by 2005, we were able to bring out this uh, anthology volume, uh, Wobblies, which uh, the, a, a leading figure in the always uh, constrained IWW, modern IWW, said recruited as many people to the IWW as anything else uh, for a couple of years anyway. It was and is very much in print, very attractive, and was a, a jump start for me into the world of comics, specifically including a piece I re requested, recruited on Emma Goldman uh, by Sharon Rudolph, which grew into uh, the Emma Goldman comic, and a piece that I recruited on the modern uh, dance uh, creator Isadora Duncan, great bohemian, uh, which grew into the Isadora Duncan comic uh, by uh, a, 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 a good uh, friend of mine, Sabrina Jones. And uh, so this was a, a beginning. It had some kind of response, and I was able to create a, another anthology, which I greatly uh, admire, enjoy, that is Students for a Democratic Society, with an aim to identify the local branches of, of SDS, 1962 to 1969, and get a grip on what happened beyond all of the crazy factionalism and the well-known New York scene and all the other things that generally take up the attention of all characterizations of, of SDS. Uh, not too successful along those lines, but I got a lot of good stories and some great local stories of uh, Austin, Texas, and Madison, Wisconsin, which were in some ways more characteristic of SDS than Columbia or UCLA or, or any of those. And even my own stories within SDS sort of snuck into that. Um, and uh, then with the same publisher, 
I was able to do something pretty successful, the, the Beats a Graphic History, which uh, effectively brought me into partnership with Harvey Picar. Now, it, it's important to remember that Harvey Picar, uh, who sort of saved the life of, of uh, a screwed up young Robert Crumb, who hit town on a, on a, from a bus from Delaware in, in 1970-something, uh, uh, Harvey Picar sort of took him in and uh, gave him friends and so forth. Well, uh, by the uh, uh, 80s, Harvey Picar was convinced by Crum to try to publish a comic of his own. I, I should say Harvey Picar was a blue-collar guy who dropped out of college in uh, Cleveland and um, began uh, uh, publishing his own comic, American Splendor, and while he was working at the VA hospital, which he did for 35 years until he was forced into retirement when the film about him and his work, American Splendor, appeared. I think that's uh, 202. But, uh, you know, he, he was a blue-collar guy who moved from neighborhood to neighborhood before the neighborhoods were wiped out by uh, urban renewal, so-called. And he recorded the lives of him and his uh, pals, and uh, meanwhile, he supported progressive uh, causes. He'd been a writer for Downbeat and other jazz magazines. He was a very, very serious and uh, an interesting character in, in many, many ways. And because he brought the lives of perfectly ordinary, especially blue-collar people, into comics as literature, uh, he uh, was said that had introduced uh, comic reading to new generations of readers all over the world to read comics in new ways, not just as supernatural adventures or even noir stories, but as more everyday sorts of things, the way the best of 1930s and 40s literature, Nelson Algren and, and others, had, had been able to do. So this was a, a major contribution, and forming a sort of partnership with him was uh, really extremely valuable for me uh, for that reason. So uh, we began working on uh, SDS together. We worked on the Beats together. Uh, we worked on several other books together. But I guess I would say uh, one of the high points would have to be Studs Terkel's working. Uh, uh, Studs Terkel was the original oral historian of Blue Collar Life and uh, his volumes about Chicago uh, blue collar life were especially phenomenal and widely beloved and plays were based on it television shows were based on it and so forth and so forth and it struck me uh, that Harvey Picar was a sort of Studs Terkel and that Studs Terkel was a sort of Harvey Picar so it was a, a natural sort of thing even though Studs sadly Studs Terkel had already died uh, to adapt his most famous work, working, into a comic with uh, with a dozen artists, and uh, it didn't wasn't as much of a seller as the publisher thought it would be. Uh, but uh, gosh, uh, it's a gorgeous book, and, and I can say that at least two other uh, recent books projects, uh, one completed, the other not, are based on this book in the sense that people got the inspiration to uh, interview people and also draw them. Uh, a self-produced comic from Seattle uh, recently uh, appeared a woman artist who was basically a fast food worker, uh, interviewed a dozen people who were uh, young, uh, more Latino than anything else in these kind of jobs, precarious jobs uh, during the pandemic and uh, straight you can ex straight excerpts of interviews plus drawings of them. It, it, it's not, not it's not great comic art, but it's very effective, and it, it's a model of sorts of how comic art can capture uh, everyday life and uh, reach to new generations. I guess before I finish with this, I want to mention one other thing, which is. Um, the, ad, uh, the adaptation of Howard Zinn's uh, People's History of the U.S. For every uh, radical in the U.S., I think that People's History has been a, a way to learn but also teach with young people uh, 
It's the single wonderfully readable book, and until Howard's death, or close to his death, he was an inveterate touring around the country. He, he was a, a counterpart, you might say, to Noam Chomsky, but more in the um, popular vein. Chomsky has, was always, still, while he was touring, better in the question and answer period, uh, you might say, whereas uh, Howard, that is with facts, whereas Howard Zinn was fabulous in offering the big picture to high school audiences as well as college audiences. And people loved him, and conservatives hated him, and conservative hawkish liberals hated him. Uh, But uh, his presence uh, was a, a real aura, and therefore the adaptation of his book uh, drawn by uh, artist, a comic artist from Madison, Michael Konopaki, who was a a labor cartoonist. And the adaptation itself, largely written by Dave Wagner, same Dave Wagner, uh, were uh, the most uh, remarkable successes in all my comic uh, work and and maybe now have reached about 100,000 people or more, presuming the books are passed around. And it never... Uh, ceases to uh, to reach new audiences. So those are certainly uh, big moments up until the last few years in, in my comics. I'm, I'm happy to go on and talk about things in the more recent past, but that sort of establishes a base of, of what I was trying to do and uh, how I, without describing it, was able to reach out to artists of, of different generations and engage them and work with them and sometimes write the scripts for them and sometimes not do anything but get them money from a publisher or someplace else that I could raise the money and then set them on their own path and promise them autonomy and a copyright ownership of their own art. Well, at least a dozen of those 100,000 copies went to my nephews, nieces, and uh, <laughs> some some other cousins because I get them for all of the youngsters for Christmas. So I, I still get that book, Paul, for uh, for the youngsters in my family and people who I know who have kids. Um, so You've I, given me the best, the best testimony possible <laughs> because uh, uh, among the things that that Zen book does is, is to talk about empire – the American empire and race, American racism in ways that is so engaging that the usual way that people have feel put off, oh, don't make me feel guilty or you're overdrawing it or this isn't interesting to read. It's more, you know, boring political correctness. The uh, Zinn's own story, I mean, my, actually my only real contribution here other than getting the contract and and fighting all the way through with various contending forces, was to insist that uh, Howard Zinn's own personal story had written a review in The Nation of Zinn's something about you can't sit still on a moving train. You can't be neutral on a moving train. That's it. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I didn't. I, I incorporated it, uh, or proposed the incorporation of it into the the comic, and I think it gives us a sensibility of of who Howard Zinn was, as, as well as his wonderful grand sweep. We we miss him badly, that's for sure, but we have a lot of him that uh, still is awfully useful to us. Now that backstory meant a lot to me because Howard, of course, was a veteran and. Myself being a That's veteran right. and coming from a family of veterans, you know, his his uh, recollections of the war and the sort of internal struggle that he faced when coming home and dealing with the, you know, the death and destruction of war and, and the fact that he was responsible for taking other people's lives. All of that yeah. resonated with me as a young veteran uh, yeah. and still does. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, Paul, I, there's so much to ask you about what you had said. I guess one of the things that might be most useful for the audience is from the IWW, and I know these are widely different sort of tradition so I yeah. whichever one you want to choose but from the IWW to Emma Goldman to Isidore Duncan SDS Studs Terkel the Beats what do you think are the lessons in other words there's people who will read those sort of things today and they'll say oh that was interesting then there's yeah. others say engaged activists and organizers who will look to that history to try and pull yeah. lessons from it for us today what do you think are some of the most important lessons that today's left activists can take from some of these traditions? Uh, well, uh, I had a couple of, I would describe them as massively unsuccessful comics that I've enjoyed anyway. Uh, 
and or semi comics with prose and comics together. One was on uh, Robin Hood, another was on uh, Johnny Appleseed, John Chapman. Uh, and uh, I, I produced things about them because they were uh, childhood heroes of mine. So uh, uh, maybe those two characters represent uh, the outsiders within American society, but within modern society as well, that retain some sense of uh, the feeling that civilization can be entirely different from the way it is, that there's no reason that it has to be the way it is. And um, the treasure of history of the IWW is a bit like that, even though they were organizing industrial workers and so forth, their uh, joie de vivre, their uh, writing satirical songs. Uh, many, many wobblies uh, lived on the road, uh, riding on the trains or simply managing to get along and moving from job to job and never feeling uh, terribly uh, tied down to the emerging industrial society. There's a lot of room for the outsiders to make a, not to feel totally isolated and, and as if they made a mistake in their lives by being outsiders. And I guess I would have to say another, one of my favorite books on mention so far in this conversation is Bohemians, uh, because uh, Bohemians is the larger story of, of what was for a short period, relatively speaking, the B generation, but had the same sort of uh, freedom of, of movement, uh, freedom of, of uh, uh, sexuality and, uh, and gender relations, things that seem so uh, commonplace now, of course, were uh, inconceivable uh, in the 1950s in, in the USA and most other places, and the empowerment of, of women in the sense that there can't be any uh, bohemianism without a, a multi uh, racial, multicultural bohemianism. Uh, a young person who feels alienated, there's a place for you. There are cultures that haven't been tapped by the books you read in, in high school. Uh, and the, most of the movies you go to, whether they're horror films or, or uh, first date films or uh, or the usual run of, of uh, banal comedies. There's something else out there that you can tap into, and it isn't just uh, a struggle against the ritual, that's a terribly important part of it, but it's also uh, envisioning a different reality, a, a, a hidden reality. Uh, I was looking at this Robin Hood book, and I started with a, uh, a quote from uh, Wilson Harris, who was known as the James Joyce of the Caribbean, is from Guyana, and uh, he said that the traditions which nourish Shakespeare or Dante or Homer, the cross-cultural traditions which nourish those writers and which bore upon the great pre-Columbian sculptors, those traditions are alive and buried within ourselves, within the world's unconscious. There is a tradition which nourishes us, even though it appears to have vanished. And that seems really important to come to grips with. Uh, just uh, imagining, for instance, the uh, uh, rising Latino culture in the United States, the numbers of people, and the uh, cultures, some of them very ancient cultures, coming from uh, Central and Latin America, uh, which indeed seem to have vanished, but cannot have vanished entirely, uh, but encompass larger visions that uh, certainly don't fit within Anglo-Saxon America, but don't fit within the larger American culture that anybody was noticing in 1950, so that many young people can think about their own grandparents, great-grandparents, and the cultures that, that those people were in, but also the cultures those people were drawing upon, and uh, respond to the total crisis of civilization which is upon us. I think those are really good things. In the more practical terms, a lot of my comics are indeed about fighting back one way or the other. Studs Terkel's working is, is offers some great examples. Uh, but in the Howard Zinn book, you remember a famous mo moment where the Pentagon Papers never never would have been revealed without Howard Zinn having a friendship with the, with the guy and uh, managing to get that stuff to the New York Times. 
and to a much wider public so that there's a, a, a possibility of acting in your own life that actually has a, a wider effect, whether it's a, a literal class struggle, a classroom situation, the creation of something in culture, uh, or something else. My mentor, uh, the great Pan-African C.L.R. James, uh, liked to say that you need to be, if you want to be a revolutionary, you need to be creative in your own life. Uh, that's something that uh, Marxist political organizations or any others are often unable to grasp. They want followers and dues and uh, and uh, group meetings and so forth. And all those may well be necessary. But the necessity to be creative or in your own life is one of the big lessons for any young radical to take in. Wow, that's a, such an important point, Paul. What, what do you think at this point, in terms of the way that the left is comprised, you have all, also just, you know, pop culture in the United States. What do you think the role is today for, say, subcultures, counterculture movements? And you're sort of hinting at that when you're saying what you just said, which is that yeah. you can't just have meetings and dues paying, so on and so forth. It's like one of the reasons we open the community space that we're sitting in today called politics, art, roots, and culture is because we saw all of these things as being absolutely ne- uh, necessary to develop a really robust, vibrant movement that we didn't just want like a bunch of really sh- smart cats sitting in a room. And we didn't want just a bunch of like non-creative, hardworking people. Like we wanted to bring all of these people together and then show people that anyone can do any of these things. Because I think working class people are often, at least in our experience, yeah. so very intimidated by these mediums. You know, they say to themselves, ah, I was told I'm going to be a a bus driver for my life. And that means that I'm this and, you know, I'm never, I'm not creative, you know, or I, I've never been a creative person. And then maybe if you put them through like a two hour zine class where they're making zines, all of the sudden after that two hours, they think to themselves, actually, I am quite creative and I have a lot to yeah. say. Um, what do you think the role of that is today? And how do you think we can engender more of it? Well, uh, a Wisconsin artist who got a MacArthur Award uh, and was much beloved as a, a comic artist who was serialized in the, the alternative papers, Linda Berry, uh, uh, is famous for saying, uh, you, you're not an artist because a teacher or an adult said you don't have any talent hmm. when you were you know, 10 years old or something. If they hadn't said that to you, you wouldn't have known you didn't have any talent. <laughs> Uh, and I, I thought that was a pretty profound thought. Uh, she had to work through it herself because she had a very, very, very difficult and violent uh, raising uh, uh, after her parents broke up and she lived with the grandmother in Seattle and various things that she developed as her comic uh, in order to explain why she and her friend didn't commit suicide, you know because their lives were so rotten and they felt so rotten about themselves. So that seems to be an extreme case, but her her point is the same as your point, that people need to realize, to be encouraged, to realize that uh, they have uh, a lot of uh, innate talent that hasn't been used, and in the practice of using it, they will uh, realize themselves and also feel better about themselves. Now, as far as today's art forms, cultural forms, you know, uh, I'm 76, so I do, as I often say within discussions in Democratic Socialists of America, I'm not prescribing for anyone. I don't think it's right for me to prescribe for anyone. The the things that are developing now and will be developing in 10 years are rather beyond me, other other than understanding what young artists are doing in, in, in comic art. I wouldn't uh, purport to give advice or even an intelligent observation about, oh, something as obvious as the evolution of stand-up comedy since the year 2000. There's a, a comic himself who wrote a, a substantial entry for the uh, third edition of the Encyclopedia of the American Left, and uh, who was he? He had a, a comedy column in uh, a socialist newspaper, which has since ceased to exist. Um, and he analyzed the uh, stand-up comedy in uh, in the New York clubs and on the cable shows uh, in the, the last 15 or 20 years. And uh, it comes down to 
a few points, uh, such as the sense the in 90s uh, comedy on television as well as uh, nightclubs was deeply cynical. People felt there was no <coughs> possibility of change. They hated the Clintons, <coughs> but uh, there didn't seem to be anything outside that Clintonian world. Sounds right to me. <coughs> and then 9-11 and the reactionary wave that came upon them set loose a huge new wave of, of comedy stuff. <laughs> which really found itself in the Comedy Channel and um, uh, and various uh, young uh, people rose to uh, unimaginable heights and, and delivered good political messages and whether they could continue on or not mattered less than they opened the road to uh, new comedy attacks on, on things as they are. <clears throat> so uh, I think that... that uh, a comedy has found a way to get beyond the usual cynicism and sexism and so forth of uh, of uh, uh, free mic night, open mic night, uh, uh, which usually uh, unleashes a uh, a lot of uh, hostility, uh, hate, hate uh, humor, and so on. And instead of uh, that kind of humor, uh, or maybe it's hate the ruling class, but instead of the narrowness of that familiar kind of humor offers something uh, very different and reveals a, a, a form, a cultural form that people seem to be able to take in. Well, that's a good example. I, I guess another good example that you, you experience is spoken word of, of people uh, giving, uh, poet, ordinary people giving, giving uh, poetry readings. Uh, and um, if we could uh, imagine a half a dozen things uh, that are web startups that come from nowhere and aren't right-wing crackpot things, but instead something creative and something interesting, we would probably be able to get a beginning, a small beginning, a sense of, of what's bubbling around us now. Yeah. Can you expand a little bit on what you just said, Paul? What do you, what do you mean by that last point that you made? Do you, do you mean that this needs to be sort of more coherent, that if we put together like more of a... <sighs> an infrastructure to project these messages or that's certainly would be preferable. Uh, I would not know how things would be put together, but I, I think that in my recent past, the uh, Bernie campaign of 2015 and also the Bernie campaign of uh, 2019, then quickly in 2020 gave a lot of people a sense of, of focus uh, a sense of possibility that something, uh, including DSA, rising to 80,000 members from the same old 5,000 members of uh, 2014, 2015, that something actually could be organized beyond uh, uh, protesting. And how how that gets organized is a, is a terribly interesting question and, and really beyond me, but uh, I guess I would say the rise of, of Jacobin is a, a pretty good example. Uh, and there are a scattering, an interesting scattering of new small magazines, knowing again that this is only a small part of things, magazines online or uh, or actually in, in printed form that are wonderfully artistic and interesting and uh, interested in, in recuperating the, the past of the, the left somehow very interested in recuperating the past of the 1960s and 1970s, which I understand very well without wanting to romanticize it all that much and uh, trying to represent it within the possible left-wing politics of today. So I would think that's about as far as I would be self-confident in uh, in going. And I leave it to the younger people to figure out how this stuff can be coordinated into something larger. So let's go back to the timeline. What are we do? It's Obama was elected in 2008. I know where I was at the time um, after the Democrats had taken the House and the Senate in 2006, didn't do much with their power. Obama takes yeah. office. People are upset by the time 2010 hits. We have the Tea Party uh, on. And also, again, I should mention in 2008, we have the uh, financial recession, the great financial crash. Yeah. 
So what what sort of projects were you working on at that time? And then the other side to this, of course, is I'm interested in your reflections from those those periods. So, you know, what are you thinking a couple years into Obama after the financial collapse? We have the Tea Party and we we have yet to reach Wisconsin or Occupy. I was gonna, just going to say we're on the lip of <laughs> Wisconsin Occupy. It, it, it's almost as if with the recession we were waiting for it. We felt there was something coming, but we didn't know what form it would take. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, the journal criti- uh, journalism criticism was becoming sharper because of the uh, recession. The criticism of the limits that we'd hit up against within the Democratic Party was getting sharper uh, because of uh, the political failures involved in the Obama administration. And uh, then, indeed, uh, comes uh, uh, first the uh, Wisconsin uprising, which you were part of. So, you know, I didn't stay overnight in the Capitol, and you did. So right there, <laughs> you were on the scene. Uh, but the daily marches that were sometimes twice daily marches and uh, sometimes were 150,000 people within a city of 200,000, which is pretty astounding. Admittedly, many people came from afar, but was a, an authentic working class movement of a new type. That is to say, the people who were most severely persecuted uh, by the uh, changes that the new right was bringing into existence were women workers, health workers, social workers, and teachers. They were the tip of the spear in all of the uh, major uh, mobilizations and so forth. Others followed them. High school students followed their teachers. Uh, And uh, just for a minute, it it sort of appeared as if I was back in Madison in 1970, except the faces I saw of my contemporaries were old instead of being young and uh, and more diverse uh, than I remember in 1970, and much more full of blue-collar uh, people, uh, admittedly. Many of them were retired workers from factories that closed and were never going to reopen. They were uh, good unionists who were given their very last pitch into a struggle for a, a different world, and they came from within Wisconsin. They came from Iowa, Illinois, Missouri, even New York and California, because it was vividly seen for a short time that this was a a struggle that reflected uh, events across the U.S. and even uh, across the world. Certainly, uh, as far as uh, Egypt, it seemed to be a cycle of uprisings that was uh, uh, hitting beyond the the limits uh, before 2000, before uh, uh, before the, the, the events of 9-11. I may be coming back to Teamsters and Turtles, the demonstrations in Seattle in 1999, uh, now to underline the irony. Mary Jo and I edited a, a book of uh, documents, essays, photos, uh, poetry, and and uh, uh, cartoons, comics, called it, it Started in Wisconsin. The irony is that it's a little more appropriate to say the the right wing capture of power outside of the South started in Wisconsin uh, with the, the the election of Governor Walker and and what he was able to do and, and the takeover of the state assembly. So it started in Wisconsin as a great title for the rise of the right, but it was less of a great title for the the rise of of social movements genuinely working class social movements uh, of uh, mostly of the newer white collar uh, workers and the crushing of that was more than heartbreaking here in Wisconsin but I now believe uh, led to the the confirmation of the Tea Party and supposedly or really an appeal of uh, right wing politics to a, uh, a fringe but a, a substantial fringe of, of the alienated blue collar population including veterans, uh, as well as the small business class, which is the real heartland of Trump supporters. But uh, when I saw the other day uh, that uh, the rallying of of clan types and uh, right-wing people 
came uh, in New York State came from upstate, from these small communities that formerly had industries and now have prisons if they're lucky, but basically are economically ruined. That also was where Bernie Sanders got his heaviest vote on New York State in in, uh, in 2016. There are people who were desperate, who will, may respond to an appeal to uh, a class, uh, but on the other hand, are capable of, of uh, becoming uh, the neo-fascist, not to put too fine a point on it, but are basically just unable to, to charter what in the world uh, they can do. So in, in Wisconsin, we have considerable voting populations and the tens of thousands have voted for Obama twice and then voted for Trump. I don't know what they did in 2020. Maybe they voted for Joe Biden. I hope so. But uh, the sense of, of very, very wide dislocation and and uh, also a, a sense of desperation. And uh, uh, I'm uh, not a strategist, so I'm not going to prescribe what to do in that. But it certainly is the reality that we face. How about the sort of years leading up to this? So after we have Wisconsin six months later in September or sometime, seven, eight months, whatever that is, uh, in September we have Occupy kicks off. Yeah. And then after that, of course, Obama wins again in 2012. The Republicans take the Senate in 2014. And then we have the uh, murder of Mike Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, leading into, of course, the 2016 primaries. What I, don't, I know you don't want to go, I'm not trying to get you to go sort of year by year, but I'm wondering what your thinking was watching what happened with Bernie in 2016 uh, and then watching, of course, the last four years of, of this this madness with Trump and, and, of course, culminating with the pandemic and, of course, the claims of election fraud and then the attempted insurrection at the Capitol. What? How do you sort of bring all of that together to sort of understand where we're at today with Joe Biden taking office? You have, and also, let me back up. If there's work you want to mention from that period that we haven't touched on, yeah. please do so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I also want to get your thoughts I, on sort I, of the current I, moment. I think that anyone who was uh, old enough to be inspired by and actually get involved in the civil rights movement, but, but even admire it to the extent in the 50s and 60s that you knew it was the core to the change, the possible changes in U.S. society, and that MLK was the the great figure in American society today, the counterpart, you might say, to Eugene V. Debs uh, in the early 20th century, uh, admired, beloved, and represented far more than he was himself. Uh, you would ha- have to say that uh, the first wave of, of Black Lives Matter following the killings in, in Missouri stirred a, a sense that things could not go on as, as they were, and uh, a large part of the minority population uh, knew it and wanted to act on it, but also very large numbers of uh, uh, white people and Latinos uh, knew that great wrongs had been done, and something had to be done. It was unclear that the Democrats would do any of that, or more than a very small portion of it. It was utterly unclear that the reform of police was going to happen. We, we had seen reforms of uh, the police in the 1970s in the cities that had major reform movements, uh, Madison, Burlington, Vermont, uh, and uh, uh, other places in California and Oregon, places that were known for their liberalism, and real steps were making, made in, in police reform. And then even those places, with the increased uh, division of, of local societies between uh, different racial categories and rich and poor, uh, lost the progress that they had made. And we could see that we could even see that the newer recruits into the police force, very often veterans, uh, had the attitude of of taking control, especially with the minority communities, rather than trying to, to turn the the temperature of the room down. Although women police are much better than that in general, uh, so uh, we could see that something was uh, badly amiss, and that the timidity of the Obama administration to do anything about it, or even make clear that it was bad, uh, uh, intolerably bad, was 
a, a real problem. And uh, one had to say during the primaries in uh, 2016 and 2020 that uh, Joe Biden had a very bad past, uh, that uh, his opposition to busing, uh, but of course also uh, uh, incarceration, uh, not to mention his foreign policy moves, which were extremely bad. And it had never been anything else but bad. You, 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 it was hard to find something good uh, beyond middle-of-the-road, uh, post-New Deal, Clinton-esque sort of uh, modest reforms, mostly of a symbolic character. So uh, one could not help feeling that uh, things were uh, uh, very, very uh, disappointing, discouraging in that sense. And yet, on the other hand, the, the strongest moment of the left, historically speaking, especially in, in the U.S., but in Europe as well, was anti-fascism. It was always the strongest moment because uh, the left was able to reach far, far beyond its normal limitations and engage uh, uh, blue-collar populations, lower-middle-class populations, and even people of means who were not enthusiastic about calling themselves socialists or communists, but could see that the left was leading the anti-fascist movement. Did that have anything to do with Antifa? I don't think so, but I don't want to, uh, to judge myself. Does it have something to do with the leftward edge within the Democratic Party around AOC and others? It probably does. And uh, they become flashpoints uh, uh, as uh, as Bernie Sanders became a flashpoint as a Jewish candidate for as a Jewish socialist candidate for president, in ways that had not uh, been viewed as as probable before, so that takes us in a direction that was seemed improbable to me in the 1990s. That is the the uh, opportunity to uh, intervene in uh, the Democratic Party liberal politics. But it also reminds me of, of the most hopeful moments after the 1960s, I think, in many places, Madison included. Chicago is different because it comes in the 1980s and Santa Cruz and some other places. Uh, the sense that it's possible to elect local officials to recreate a, a, a culture locally in which people get along with each other. There's a, a, a struggle to bring about a greater sense of equality. In all these cases, there's a proliferation of, of co-ops, uh, which may occupy only 5% of the commerce, but have a, an influence far beyond their economic uh, uh, leverage. They, they give us a sense that life could be different in some way. And people in Chicago who had been wild-eyed malice in 1969, those very people that I opposed, uh, some of them became uh, uh, wonderfully politically active in the Harold Washington years because they'd been sincere, if sincerely wrong, uh, and they had the contacts and, and uh, they managed to make themselves extremely useful. And then the Harold Washington period is over and, and everything goes back to the old uh, politics in, in many ways. And worse than that, the sense of something that had been reached and then slipped away is very strong. Certainly it's very strong in, in Madison, Wisconsin, but there are many other places uh, that, uh, that seem to be pointing toward a new direction at a certain point, and then that slipped away. To, to get that back, to have a sense locally that things can be done as well as uh, uh, nationally, that, that things can be organized, uh, that e even involve electing officials and so forth. That's quite important, uh, but uh, always uh, within the, uh, the limits presented any radical at any time. What do you make of the current situation and moving forward? We have Donald Trump leaving office tomorrow. Joe Biden is coming in. It doesn't seem clear right away that Joe Biden plans to govern like a neoliberal. In other words, I had just read an interesting analysis from Doug Henwood about the $1.9 trillion stimulus package mm -hmm. that, that Biden right. is offering. Of well, course, I, it's I not. I have one great hope and one great fear, and that is, the great hope is that uh, 
uh, Biden feels compelled by a situation to uh, lead a shift to the left, which he'll never describe as a shift to the left domestically. And I have one very great fear, which is the appointments on foreign policy positions yeah. Yeah. that closely resemble uh, previous Democratic administrations and seem to be in the direction of reasserting uh, American influence, i.e. American control over the planet uh, through aggressive means. Uh, as much of a monster as Trump was in so many different ways, uh, the U.S. did not engage in any new uh, invasions and wars. And uh, we don't know what the future holds, but uh, there's uh, an appetite out there in what's called the blob, the foreign policy establishment that goes from administration to administration without making much of a change and shifts from so-called humanitarian or actual humanitarian branches into hawkish policies and back and forth and even sets up its own uh, 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 weapons companies uh, and uh, makes a million dollars between uh, uh, jobs and government and then comes back with the same allies they'd had uh, in the weapons companies. All that stuff is a cause for great concern and that brings us back to LBJ who truly we believe now believed in the great society. He was a school teacher from Texas with a minority classroom and he did a lot of uh, rotten things in order to rise so high, but he, he seems to really believe in the, the great society, a phrase that goes back to the Britain of Robin Hood uh, and the Watt Tyler's revolt. It was a vision from below. It wasn't a vision from above. And uh, how much further could LBJ have gone if he didn't allow himself to be drawn by the smart boys of the Kennedy years into uh, deeper and deeper into the Vietnam War and then unable, uh, a war addicted like to get away from it. Well, that's a very favorable picture of LBJ. That's one I didn't have at the time. But I can easily see that sincere reformers who want to make the system work in some way and therefore have to make a huge egalitarian uh, adjustment could also be drawn into foreign policy intrigues and wars that will ruin the whole thing. So, so, yeah, we a, hang by a, a warning threat. for us. <laughs> <laughs> a war a warning for our period moving forward, no doubt about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, shit, Paul, that wasn't a positive way to end, but I I still uh, think it's a good way uh, to end. <laughs> I, I know, I know, I know. I'm I'm uh, I'm on tender hooks now, but uh, on the other hand, because there has to be an, uh, another hand, the. Uh, uh, Election victory in Georgia, albeit Democrats with a black voting base primarily, and the sense of outrage at the right-wing nuts from the invasion of the Capitol has produced a moment. Yep. Now we're hoping that the people can do the, the most with the moment that's been presented with us. Hey, thank you for watching and listening. If you think this program is worth a pack of cigarettes or a cheeseburger, you could become a Patreon for as little as $3 a month. The link is available at our website, parkmedia.org. That's P-A-R-C media.org. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel below. Also, you could find us on Instagram at Park Media, Facebook at Politics, Art, Roots, Culture, and you could find me on Twitter at Vince Emanuele.